today, I, I want to talk to you about stepping out. Stepping out. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 3, and we'll start with verse 1, and for the opening text, we'll read to verse 4. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 and 4, and then we'll pray. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. But there shall be a distance between you and it of about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it. In order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Father, we just summon your grace right now. We beckon your presence. We beckon your communion of the Holy Spirit to come and to quicken us to infuse us with divine enlightenment and understanding. Lord, I am in need of your grace to, to teach and to communicate and to impart life to your people. We only need to hear from you this morning. And so would you grant us, Lord, an audience with you and provide us manna from heaven. Amen. So this is Joshua and the people of Israel. This is at the end of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. It was a journey that was only supposed to take a few days when Moses brought Israel out of Egypt. But because of, you know the story, because of Israel's disobedience, they ended up wandering for 40 years. Just imagine that. For 40 years wandering in the wilderness, going in circles. Some of you may feel like 2018 was a year of wandering in circles. You've come to the end of the year and you may feel emotionally, mentally, financially, relationally that you've made no progress. You've just been wandering. But what's interesting about Israel's wandering in the wilderness is God's goodness was still present. The Bible says that he led them by pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He provided water for them in the wilderness. He provided manna for them, food and substance in the wilderness. In fact, the scriptures and the Psalms even says, think about this, 40 years in the wilderness, the, the, the Psalms decree that their shoes never wore out, nor their clothes. There was no shopping mall. There was no bond times, no J.A. Banks. God provided for them in the wilderness, even in the midst of their rebellion and their disobedience. And here is Israel on the crops of entering into the thing that God brought them out of Egypt for. Many of you here today, I'm here to encourage you that on the other side of 2018, there is a place of purpose and destiny that God has for you. The promised land, Canaan, was supposed to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And for us in 2019, there's a prepared place for us. There's purpose that God has for us. There are things that God wants to work in you, that God wants to work on you, and that God wants to work through you so that he can make impact, not just in your life, but in the lives of those around you in 2019. And here Joshua is preparing the hearts of the people to cross over. And for them, the promised land was a story. These were kids when they came out. Some of them probably weren't even born. 
And they heard about this promised land. They heard about this God that made promises, and it was going to all be good. And all they've known is wandering. And now Joshua is preparing them to enter into what for them was only a dream and only a concept. So as we think about the crust of a new year at the end of an, of an old year, what we want to look at is from the scriptures, what are some of success principles that we can draw out of our text that can give us guidance and instruction on how God wants to navigate our hearts and our spirits as we prepare to enter into a new year. So, so I decided to call this stepping out, stepping out. Because you know, you know, back in the day when you stepped out, right? Back in the day, New Year's Eve, you about to step out, you took a lot of time, you put a lot of effort into preparing yourself to step out. So today we want to talk about and have a conversation about how do we prepare ourselves to step out of 2018 so that we can effectively step into 2019. If you go back to our base text in Joshua uh, chapter 3 verse 1, it says, then rose Joshua early in the morning and they set out from Shittim, 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 Shittim. Almost sounds like a curse word if you say it too many times in a row. Shittim. Uh, Shittim was, 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 was a place of thorns. Shittim was, 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 a, was, was a place where there were these um, uh, bushes or like I used to have this tree in my backyard. It was a holly tree. And ain't nothing cute about a holly tree because all of its leaves got thorns on them. You'd be walking in the backyard bare, barefoot. You get all these thorns in, 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 in your feet. Shittim was a place where there was these, 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 these thorns. It was the place where Israel had settled, and it was a place where they struggled because they kept disobeying God in terms of not intermingling with the nations around them. It's the place where Israel's disobedience from the previous generation had continued. So Siddim speaks to a place of thorniness. It speaks to a place of disobedience. It speaks to a place that doesn't represent God's perfect will. And Joshua rose up, and he was determined to leave and to set out from Shittim. You, 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 you may be in a place in your 2019 where it's been your Shittim. It's been a place where you have not necessarily been completely obedient to God. It's been a place that represents for you thorns. It's been a place that represents intermingling and intertwining with the things of the world. And this, this, this moment of transition into 2019 marks an opportunity for you to begin to set yourself out, to step out, to move away from. And it says, and they came to Jordan, and he and all the people of Israel lodged there before they passed over. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp. And when they went through the camp, they commanded the people and said, you see the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented God, God's divine presence amongst the people. Anybody see the movie uh, 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 Raiders of the Lost Ark? Had the Ark of the Covenant in it. And the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. It represented God's covenant presence amongst his people. The Ark of the Covenant rested inside of the Holy of Holies in the temple. And it was very seldom that the people would have opportunity to view the Ark of the Covenant. The only time they brought the Ark of the Covenant out was when they were entering into battle, or in this case, when they were about to transition into the land of promise. Now, there's something important about the Ark of the Covenant. It contained three items in it. In it was the tablet of stone that God gave Moses the law on. It speaks to God's holiness and God's rule and our desire to walk after the word of God. There was Aaron's rod that budded. Remember when there was a dispute about who God had actually anointed to be the priest. Moses' Moses's, um, um, sister and some of the other elders, they said, well, we feel like we God's chosen. We feel just as holy as you, uh, Aaron. Why, why are you special? 
and they had a contest and they threw rods in the temple. And when they came in the next morning, it was uh, uh, Aaron's rod that had budded with almonds, which signifying life. And so Aaron's rod was in the Ark of the Covenant. And that represents the fact that we are God's chosen people, God's select. The third thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant is the pot of manna. And the manna speaks to God's provision. So here when Joshua says, listen, we are going to set out and as, so, as, you, as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. The application for us is, as we begin to move and transition from 18 into 19, there's an attitude that we have to have about ourselves. We have to be able to see God. And when we see the Ark of the Covenant, we have to be able to recognize that we are called to live life by a standard, a rule, which is the Word of God that we are chosen and select people, that God specifically selected and chose you and I. We, 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 we are not just, we are not orphans. We, we, we are not just hapless, meaningless, insignificant people, that we are divinely chosen and selected by God. And then the manna reminds us that just as God provided for Israel in the wilderness, God is going to provide for us. God has provided for us, and God will provide for us. That allows us to have a perspective, a vision about God that is intended to build and to develop our confidence. And Joshua said that when you see the Ark of the Covenant, follow it. See, it's hard to follow God if you're not convinced that he'll provide for you. See, because if I'm not convinced that God will provide for me, I'm tempted to try to provide for myself. How many, how many people have ever, have ever done that? I've, I've, I've tried to provide for myself many, many a times. If, 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 I, if I can't see God, I, I, I won't follow him because I, I, I won't believe that I'm special. I, I won't believe that I'm chosen, because if I'm not chosen, then what, what, what does it matter to God about what happens to my life? Joshua says, you have to see the ark in order to follow it. Let me ask you a question. Wherever Israel went, the ark of the covenant was in front of them. It led them in to battle. What have you followed in 2018? What is it that you saw that you fixed your eyes on and that you followed? Because whatever you followed led you somewhere. What did you follow? Where did it lead you? Did you get what you wanted? And if you did get what you wanted, what did it do for your soul? Remember, the psalmist talks about Israel when they was in the wilderness crying. The Bible says God gave them what they wanted, but it sent leanness to their soul. You know, sometimes you can get what you want, but it do you no good. Right? You get that man you want, but it don't do you no good. You get that woman, you don't do you no good. You get that, you get that car you want, and then them bills kick in, and the monthly payments kick in, and it don't do you no good. What, what, what are you fixing your eyes on? To follow. That's an assessment that we all have to do. Because they say the definition of insanity is what? To do the same thing, expecting a different result. The commandment here, the instruction here, the principle here is... I have to have a revelation of who God is and who I am in relationship with God. It's a divine insight and understanding. Then it's easy for me to follow because I see. We will often follow what is most visible to us. And if I don't have spiritual discernment, I will follow anything that becomes visible. 2019, what is going to guide you into your new year? What will guide you? Joshua told the people of Israel, if you're going to be able to transition effectively into the land of promise, into what God has prepared for you, you're going to have to be able to not only see God, 
but you're going to have to be able to follow God. Look at verse 4. Trying to give you some simple principles today. Verse 4, he says, Yet, as you see God and follow God, yet there shall be a distance between you and it of about 2,000 cubics. A distance. A distance. 2,000 cubics. I have to see God in order to follow God. But in following God, Joshua said, don't, don't, don't get too close. Keep your distance. You remember the story in the Bible of somebody who actually got too close to the Ark of the Covenant? Remember what his name was? Remember Uzzah? Uzzah. Uzzah's name meant strength. And later on, a couple of, couple of hundred years later, when they're taking the Ark of the Covenant, from the Philistines and are trying to bring it back in amongst God's people, they put it on a cart. God never told them to carry the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, but they were doing what the world did. That's a whole nother sermon right there. They were trying to bring God's presence amongst the people using the world's methodologies and systems. Yeah, that's a whole nother message right there. But the Bible says it was on the cart. It was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of a sanctified priesthood, but they had it on a cart, and the cart hit a rock, and it stumbled a little bit, and the Ark of the Covenant was about to fall over, and Uzzah, in his strength, was going to help God out. And so the Bible says he reached out his hand to stay the Ark, just to stop it from tipping over. And God struck him dead right there because he was trying to help God out. Last I heard, God don't need no help. What Joshua is saying here to Israel is as you follow God, as you see God, as you have divine revelation about God, about his presence, his provision in your life, the fact that you are his purchased possession, the fact that you are guided and directed by his word. And as you see that and follow that, Joshua told the people, don't get too close. Keep your distance. And, and, and this speaks to having a reverence for God. Having a sense of the fear of the Lord. And, 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 and I feel sometimes as if God's people, we've, we've lost reverence for God. We, 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 we've become too familiar, too comfortable. You know, God's our homeboy. God's our buddy. There's no reverential awe for God. That's, that's what the distance represents. The distance represents a healthy, holy, spiritual regard and value for God's holiness and his presence. Keeping our distance. And I wonder, because we don't keep the proper distance, if we don't have the proper regard, I wonder if at times that blocks us from being able to see enough to follow. Because in the natural, He's saying, keep enough distance so you can see it. So you can see it out in front. Don't, 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 don't get so close that you can't see it. And I wonder sometimes if because we are too close, that we lose sight of who God really is. And we lose reverence. We, we, we put our hands to the things of God in such haphazard ways. We go about handling our relationship with him in such haphazard ways. We pick it up, we put it down, we fit it in when we can fit it in. We, we, we kind of, when I got time for it, okay, come on in. When I ain't got time for you, you stay out there. That's what he's talking about. If we're going to transition into a year of promise, a year that is full of all the goodness that God wants us to possess, I think one of the key points 
is how's your reverence for God? See, that's why I was talking earlier in the beginning that I was just so sober about what is my response to God's goodness, man? Again, do we just take it as if it's owed to us, as if we earned it, as if we're entitled to it? And what does that really, what does God really want from me as a result of that? that I think that's what Joshua was talking to us this morning when he says, see it, follow it to keep a distance, have a healthy fear of the Lord, a healthy spiritual regard. Now watch what he says. He says, yet there should be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length, but don't come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. Do not come near it. Don't, 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 don't lose that regard. Don't, don't lose the fear of the Lord. Don't, don't lose holy reverence for God. Why? So that you may know the way you shall go. For you have not passed this way before. See, what he's saying is, when I lose that reverence from God, I lose the ability to have divine revelation. I lose the ability to see things and to receive from God, the God who, remember we talked the other day, the, the God that's not limited by what we call time. So for us, what is our tomorrow, God has already saw it. He's not limited by time. And we're traveling into a year that we have never been in. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know. We can plan. We can think. Right? Some of you, you feel real comfortable and real secure right now because you got a job. And your employer promised you and told you, I will pay you X. And you rest in that. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know how solid and strong your company is, right? Unless you got one of them good government jobs. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Here's the point. Oh, help me, help me, help me, help me. Here's the point, guys. There are things that God wants to show us. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us, part of his job is to show us the things which are to come. We, Joshua told Israel, you've never been this way before, so you need to have a right relationship with God so that you can understand what you're moving into because you've never passed this way before. We've never been in the year that we are heading into. We've never experienced life on the other side of 2018. We don't know what it holds, but God knows. And if we don't have the proper relationship, the proper reverence for God in our heart, if we're not seeing God through the lens of his word, that my life is guided by his word, if we're not seeing God through the lens of I am his chosen possession. And we're not seeing God through the lens of he is my provider. God guides where he provides. If I'm not seeing God through that lens, then it's going to be hard for me to follow him. And if I don't follow him, I don't get direction into a year that I've never been in before. And God wants to guide and God wants to direct. The Bible says that the footsteps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. See, the footsteps of the righteous aren't ordered by my feelings, although we allow our feelings to guide us, don't we? I do. I get myself tripped up all the time. The footsteps of the Lord aren't ordered by fear. How many times do we make decisions and choose directions because we're afraid of what we might lose? You know, it's one thing to make a decision. Me, I'm often, oftentimes when I make a bad decision, I make it because I'm fearful of what I might lose, right? I'm just being honest here, right? Just being honest. Maybe you don't make decisions governed by fear. It's just me. Pray for me. But the Bible says that the footsteps of the righteous are to be erected by the Lord. Not money, not, not, not fear, not emotion, but faith. But God can't guide my footsteps if I don't see him. Because if I don't see him properly, I won't follow him. 
and, and, and part of the necessity to reflect on the year that's gone by before I move on into the next year is to examine and analyze what has guided me? What was I looking at in 2018? Am I happy with where I am? Is God happy with where I am? Because, you know, we can self-delude, right? We can self-rationalize. Joshua told Israel, you're, you're, you're about to go somewhere where you've never been before. You've never been this way before. There's all kinds of unknown obstacles and challenges that are in the new year above, ahead. But God has already gone before you. God has already made a way. I mean, I mean, I gotta get out of here. Let me, can I tell you this story real quick? So, this one thing that I really, really needed God to do for me. He did it in 2018, but he did it through an encounter that he orchestrated in 2017 that I forgot all about. This person that I met, I forgot, forgot all about it. And I have to believe that it was God that guided my footsteps because it was a friend of mine that said, hey, this is when I was running for mayor, he said, hey, I, I'm going down to Philly for dinner with a friend and he's a rich guy and he likes politics and who knows, maybe he'll write you a check. You know, when you're running for office, when somebody say check, you're like, I'm there. <laughs> Tell me when and where. So we go down to Philly. I meet this cat. He writes me a nice, big, fat check. And I thought that was the end of it. But God, who knows my tomorrow better than I remember my yesterday, God already knew the moment I went into that man's apartment that he was going to be the means of fulfilling my need in 2018. Is this making sense? Are you, are, you, are you getting this? But if I hadn't allowed God to guide me down to that meeting, there would have been no provision in 2018. So, so the need to be able to see God and to follow God and to understand, to allow God to guide and direct your steps is so important. Because oftentimes, we don't, we don't get to the place that we want to, not because God doesn't want it for us, not because God hasn't prepared it for us, it's because we haven't kept our distance, and we don't see because we can't follow. Watch. Verse 5. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders amongst you. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders amongst you. I, I want to talk a little bit first about this, about this for tomorrow. The tomorrow that Joshua was speaking of that next day would be the anniversary of the day on which 40 years earlier, God had taken them out of Egypt. 40 years earlier, God had brought them out of Egypt under the power of the blood on what we call Passover, which our communion is a reflection and a remembrance of. So 40 years later, on that very day, when a lamb was sacrificed to be a covering, to come out of bondage and be delivered from death, that's the day that Joshua said, God's going to do some powerful stuff amongst you that day. But he said, before that, you have to consecrate yourselves consecrate yourselves consecrate yourselves consecrate yourselves consecrate your 
yourself consecrate your self consecrated to be set apart that word consecrate is the same word that's used for the vessels that were in the tabernacle those vessels were holy because they were set apart for divine use say that again those vessels were holy because they were set apart for divine use. I remember back early, back, back early when I was, uh, just got saved. I think I told you the other story one time. Uh, I was at a men's, men's uh, 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 singing practice. And I leaned up against the communion table. Boy, you, you, boy. Them deeks let me have it. What? Don't, 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 that, that, that's the communion table. That, that, because in their hearts and minds, that was consecrated. That was more consecrated than me. I want you to just think about that for a moment. Now, I'm going to close out here. I, I, want you to, I want you to get this. I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Joshua said, listen, we, we, we're, we're leaving from the place of thorniness. We're leaving from, from, from the place where we dibbled and dabbled with the world. We're, we're, le we're leaving from the place where we rested at, at the end of a season of wandering that kept us from entering into our purpose. And as he directed them, he said, we need to get up and we need to move out from here. He says, I want you to be able to set your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's presence. Because the Ark represented the fact that we are guided and directed by God's word, that we are God's chosen people. And God has promised to guide and to provide for us. And he said, you got to keep a proper distance from it so that you can follow it. You can have, have the right heart regard towards God. He said it's important because you're going into a direction that you've never gone before. And so you need God's guidance. And then he says to the people, God's going to do some powerful stuff with you the next day. The same thing he did 40 years earlier when he brought your fathers out underneath the power of the blood. God's going to do some powerful stuff amongst you. But before that happens, he says you must consecrate yourselves. You must set yourselves aside for divine purpose and use. That's not something that anybody else can do for you. You have to consecrate your self. You have to consecrate yourself. The first thing that you have to recognize is this. Go to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to yourself. I know you are American. I know you've embraced, you, you've embraced the American culture of liberty and freedom and independence and the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. I know you've accepted that, but that's not what you signed up for when you said yes to Jesus. When you said yes to Jesus, you gave all that up. You're still living like your life belongs to you. To do it what you want, when you want, the way you want, how you want, to the degree you want. And wonder why you can't get into the promised land. Wonder why you can't experience milk and honey flowing. And that's not stuff. We ain't talking about stuff. Because you got a credit card and have decent credit, you can get stuff. We ain't talking about stuff. The commandment Joshua gives to the children is to consecrate themselves. 
And it begins with us transitioning out of this year into the next year, recognizing we don't belong to ourselves. You don't. Let me say that again. Hear my words. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. Well, why? For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. If we are going to see God do the miraculous for us in 2019, Joshua told Israel, consecrate yourselves because tomorrow God is going to do some awesome stuff. If we want to see God do awesome stuff in our 2019 of tomorrow, we have to consecrate ourselves today. How many of you have desires for God to do awesome stuff in your family, in your health, with your spiritual strongholds, in your relationships, and in your finances? The key is our willingness to consecrate ourselves, to set ourselves apart for God's purpose more than our own, to stop fitting God into your schedule when it's convenient. Because you know that's what you've done. Being willing to take all the areas that we want to see God move in and give them back to him to become living sacrifices, to set ourselves apart for divine purpose and use. That's what God is talking about. That's what God wants on the edge of 2018, transitioning into 2019. That's the thing that God wants most of all. But it comes, though. Can I see him? Do I see the Ark of the Covenant? Do I see God's presence? Do I live and order my life according to the word of God? Do I see myself as his chosen possession? Do I recognize that he has the ability to provide and to guide. Consecrate yourselves. No one else can do this for you. No one else is going to clean up your television and movie watching habits. No one else is going to change your bad attitude. No one else is going to forgive that person for you that you refuse to forgive. No one else is going to do it for you. We must consecrate ourselves. And each of us sitting here right now at this moment, by the divine unction of the Holy Spirit, you all know just now, in the last 30, 45 seconds, the Holy Spirit told you what that thing is. Right? He told you what that thing is. You have to decide. To consecrate yourself. Because if there's no consecration, there's no miraculous. No consecration, no power. Joshua 3, 6. And Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. And they went before the people. You have to know, you have to believe that God is always moving before you. God is always going ahead of you. God is always attempting and desiring to make a way out of no way. Verse 7, 
the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Here's the deal. If we keep God in the proper perspective and allow him to guide our footsteps and to lead us into the uncharted territories of tomorrow, he promises to exalt us before all those who watch and observe our lives so that they will know something. See, watch this. I got to get out of here. Watch this, watch this. He says, I'm going to exalt you. That, that means I'm going to lift you up. Now, here's the deal. That lifting up may not be the way you want. That, see, we hear that in our flesh. Oh, exalted? That, that means applause, that means the praises of men, that means elevation and promotion. That ain't what he's talking about. Because Jesus was exalted. And what happened when he got exalted? That meant Calvary. Oh, Lord. Mm. See? There are some things God wants to put to death in you in 2019. There are some things that the Lord is saying it's time for it to die. It's, it's time for you to let that thing go. You've been nurturing that thing. You've been feeding that thing. You've been caressing that thing. You, you, you've, dug, you, you've dug the grave for it time and time again, but you're afraid to put it in the grave and put the dirt on top of it. But, but God is saying that if I'm going to do something in your life in 2019, if I'm going to address and touch the areas that you need for me to address and to touch, then you've got to let some things be exalted. And that always leads to death. He says, there's some things I want to put to death in you so that the people who are watching your life, the people that are around you, they'll know something about you. And what they'll know about you is, I'm with you. Not, not, not what kind of house you live in, what kind of car you drive how much money you make. That ain't the stuff God wants people to know about you. What God wants people to know about you is God is with you. God is with you. Last night, my, my, my brother Art asked me if I would come watch the football game with him, right? And uh, I was like, ah, I don't know. Uh, he went to um, the, the sports bar, Mondo, on 9th Street. And Mondo was a cat we grew up with in the gardens and the DJ you know, was, was uh, Julio, and Art was telling me, you know, Julio's a DJ. I was like, man, I don't know no guy named Julio. And when I got, to the, when I got there, he said, this is Julio. I said, man, that ain't Julio, that's Bosky. <laughs> but, 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 here's the point with me, here's the point with me. People know that God is with Dave Joe. When, when I walked into the pub, I just had wings and, wings and a coat. That's all I had. People were coming in there, and they was walking in there, and they was like, <laughs> they're walking in. You no know, cats I grew up, they're walking. You could just see them as they were coming around the corner. Like, <laughs> hey, pastor, what you, what, what you doing in here? <laughs> see, God wants people to know that you walk with him. That's why we need to consecrate our lives so that he can exalt us. And exalting us really means putting to death the things of the flesh in us so that all that is left is God. So that the people around us can know, oh man, God's with that brother. God's with that sister. She may be riding a hoopty, but God's with her. Yeah, she may be living up in the hood, but God's with her, and I, I, I want that, because I got a nice car, I got a nice house, and I ain't happy, because God ain't with me, but she got something, I got, yeah, I, I want some of that. that. That's the thing that God wants to do in our midst in 2019. So the thing that we have to be careful of and mindful of is no matter what the new year holds, God promises to be with us to never leave us, to never forsake us, to always be with us even till the ends of the earth. 
I leave you at Romans 8, 35. We, we, we need to leave the place of wandering. We have to have divine vision to see God. And seeing God, seeing God through the lens of his word that guides us, seeing God through the lens that we are his chosen possession, seeing God through the lens that he will provide for us so that in seeing it, we can follow it. And in following God, we have to have the proper attitude of spiritual reverence and God and regard so that God can lead us and direct us in the place that we've never been before. But in order for God to do that, we have to consecrate ourselves. We have to set aside ourselves for divine use and purpose and realizing that there's some stuff in us and consecrating us that God wants to put to death so that he can exalt us. In exalting us, he can demonstrate something to the people who are watching our lives, the same people who are waiting for you to fail. Those are the same people God wants to realize that God's with you. And as we enter into the new year with that, here's the promise of certain we can have. Who shall separate us from the love of God of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. He's talking about dying to the flesh, dying to the things of the flesh, laying down your life for the sake of the brethren. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Whatever 2019 holds, you have to have a persuasion. I am persuaded, he says, that nor the things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord.